This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Right, it is my great pleasure to introduce our final speaker um, after such an impressive day of uh, really, really interesting papers. This is the final keynote, the crowning finish, um, and it's Michael Dobson, and he's asked me to be brief, so I'm just going to... Um, rapidly read off the many things one could say about Michael Dobson. He's the director of the Shakespeare Institute in Stratford-upon-Avon and professor of Shakespeare Studies. Um, among many other institutions, he's taught at Harvard, Northwestern, University of Illinois at Chicago, Roehampton, Birkbeck, you name it, he's taught there. Um, Michael is founder and board member of the European Shakespeare Research Association and um, for the sake of brevity, I'll only list two of his numerous publications, namely The Making of the National Poet, that came out in 1992, and Shakespeare and Amateur Performance, that came out in 2011. And I will point out that Michael's uh, paper title has changed slightly. It's now Shakespearean Comedy, Theatrical Hegemony, and the Boundaries of Europe. So thank you, Michael. Uh, thanks very much, Emily, and I hasten to stress that I'm not fobbing off on you a paper I wrote for something else. This is actually the same stuff that I was always going to write about. I just, uh, I just changed the title of it. Um, and I am going to mention comedy of errors very fleetingly. Uh, good. Um, given that I was regrettably unable to come to the conference yesterday due to the importunacy of the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust, uh, a very needy organisation, um, I have a nerve giving the last alleged keynote at this conference at all. And given the narrowness of my published research to date, which has been almost entirely concerned with the professional and non-professional stage history of the Shakespeare canon among anglophones, I realize that I'm speaking here very much as an amateur. What I can belatedly bring to a gathering interested in adapting, performing, and reviewing Shakespearean comedy in a European context, however, is some knowledge of the history of adapting and performing Shakespearean comedy over the last four centuries, and some experience of reviewing it over the last three decades, uh, together with the germs of a new research project about Shakespeare and the idea of national theatres. Uh, I think I probably do mean germs as well, the way it's shaping up. <laughs> um, out of these, I propose, first of all, to distill some wild generalizations about problems which, for all I know, you probably all solved yesterday, uh, notably the troubled relation of Shakespeare to the main pan-European traditions of stage comedy, and the notion of spectatorly competence, which that tradition underwrites. From there, however, I will move on to a single case study, uh, which I hope will abandon those generalizations completely. I can say of the case study in question that it at least has one virtue not always shared by case studies aired at performance studies conferences, namely that I will be describing a show which I know for a fact that a whole two other people here saw, <laughs> uh, namely uh, Alex and uh, Nicoletta Chin Poets. Okay, this one. I'm going to be talking about this production directed by Yaroslav Fedorishin for the Voskresenia Academic Theatre of Lvov in the Ukraine. Uh, which Alex and Nicoletta and I saw on one notable and politically charged occasion in the Balkans last month. Since we saw it in Romania, it was on that occasion entitled Intanuri Cu Prospero, though when the company themselves take show on international tours, as you can see, they usually give it the English title to meet Prospero. The fact that I still have no idea how this show might have been advertised to Ukrainian audiences, nor what it might have meant to them, that will be part of my point. Right, uh, first bit, Shakespearean European comedy. First generalization then, present day British audiences don't trust foreigners with Shakespearean comedy. <laughs> uh, or at least the theatre managers who cater for them don't expect them to do so. During the 10 years or so when I was reviewing the Shakespeare survey and seeing on average at least one Shakespearean production a week, I covered visiting non-English language productions of Othello, King Lear, Hamlet, Romeo and Juliet, Richard II, Coriolanus, and Titus Andronicus. But other than Yukio Minagawa's heartbreaking Pericles, staged as if by refugees, cheap by Jowl's brusque Russian Twelfth Night, 
and Tim Supple's part Anglophone tourist fantasy of India, Midsummer Night's Dream, I don't remember writing about any non-Anglophone performances at the comedies. In fact, until the World Shakespeare Festival in 2012, about which uh, you've already heard from Erin, among others, I had only ever seen non-English language productions of Shakespearean comedy outside the UK. Those productions, it has to be admitted, sometimes translated Shakespeare's comedies into shows not recognizable as comedy at all. In 1999, for instance, the Deutsche National Theatre in Weimar staged the most depressing much ado, Weil Lang and Nitz, that I have ever seen. Uh, and just this April, they followed it up with an equally cheery Twelfth Night, in which, in which the play concluded with the suicide of Viola. And I'm, sure these, I'm sure these shows kept dramaturgs out of the dull queues, and, 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 and a lot, kept a lot of actors in work and spent an enormous amount of public money, but they were really very depressing. Uh, but in any case, nobody invited them to bring either show to the Barbican, or even to get out first of all. Behind the reluctance of British theatrical managements to host foreign productions of the comedies, no matter how many surtitled tragedies may lend a wholly spurious internationalism to their schedules, lies, I think, a very deep-rooted understanding of the theatrical kinds, one which still hasn't managed to accommodate what Shakespeare did with them. According to this view, comedy is local, while tragedy is universal. Comedy takes us down among the lower orders to share in the misunderstandings and contingencies of the quotidian, while tragedy raises us up among the gods. The most famous articulation of this view is probably that of W. B. Yeats in his essay, The Tragic Theatre, 1910. Quote, tragedy must always be a drowning and breaking of the dikes that separate man from man, and it is upon these dikes comedy keeps house. If comedy depends on difference, treating otherness as hilariously incurable, then of course it isn't going to travel across borders. Jokes are culture-specific. If you want to sell tickets to more than one linguistic community, what you need is something that everybody is going to get everywhere, namely death. <laughs> Yeats was himself a cultural nationalist who thought that Shakespeare had been too cosmopolitan in his choice of source materials, wishing elsewhere that the English drama of the 16th and 17th centuries hadn't been infected by the Italian Renaissance, Yeats writes that, quote, no man, even though he be Shakespeare, can write perfectly when his web is woven of threads that have been spun in many lands, end quote, uh, which is pretty good from somebody who wrote in English and who composed the Lake Island in his free about three blocks from here. But his perspective on tragedy and comedy could hardly be described as uniquely Irish, being essentially a commonplace of European neoclassicism. His is a view which would have been recognized by Plautus and which was endorsed by Ben Jonson. And in that they organized Shakespeare's plays into an ascending hierarchy of genres, running from comedies through histories to tragedies, it was clearly shared by the editors of the Shakespeare Folio, Henry and Conwell. To some extent, it was shared too by Shakespeare, who derived much of his sense of comedy from Latin and Italian models, as in the obvious cases of Comedy Bearers, adapted from Plautus, and Love's Labour's Lost, which, for all its euphuistic verbal elaboration and its trick aborted non harlequinade ending, is at heart an orthodox piece of Commedia dell'arte, pedants, comedy rustic, miles gloriosus, and all. Next generalization. During Shakespeare's lifetime, as the institution of semi-public court theatre, complete with court-subsidised opera house buildings, consolidated and expanded its range across Europe, a hegemony was already emerging in stage comedy across the continent. It was destined to produce a striking pan-European convergence by the end of the 18th century, when writers such as Kersabu and Beaumarchais could have different local translations and adaptations of their plays running in several countries at once. It's a hegemony of which some traces still remain, uh, as in the international success of Yasmin Reza's art, for example, uh, and also as in uh, the fact that I bet none of you can tell me which theatre this is. You know, if, you arrived, if you arrive there, you think, oh, look, here I am in Europe in about 1830 watching a play could be anywhere. You know, it's, it's actually the Burg Theatre in Vienna, but I mean, all playhouses look like this, so you could tour 
uh, between all of them, uh, if you could organize it, uh, which is a big proviso, of course. Uh, it's striking that both the comedy of errors and Love's Labour's Lost not only disappeared from the repertory in England, but were translated or performed elsewhere for most of the three centuries that followed Shakespeare's death. In this instance, not because they seemed alien to what became the norm of theatrical comedy in the age of the Baroque, but because they didn't. If your present-day theatre is already giving you Ravenscroft or Calderon or Goldoni, you hardly need the comedy of errors. And if it's giving you Congreve or Mozart too, then you won't need Las Vegas Lost either. Uh, not until the mid-19th century anyway, when some prudish opera houses, which found Da Ponte's libretto to Cosi Pantuzzi too transgressive, started using a text adapted from the unknown Las Vegas Lost in its place. In so far as Shakespeare had written well-made rom-coms, some of his comedies still made sense, but that didn't necessarily make them irresistible, either abroad or at home. Much Ado About Nothing, for example, is Beatrice and Benedict plot transposed into one of the first new comedies of the 1660s, Davenant's The Law Against Lovers, was so obviously the precursor of Restoration comedy that during the Restoration, when there were lots of new plays about bickering wooers anyway, nobody felt any need to revive it. It's a sign of how genuinely European this type of stage comedy was in this period of the proscenium arch. But before Much Ado did get revived whole on the English stage, it was first performed in 1737 in an adaptation which hybridized it with parts of a Moliere play, La Princesse de Lille. Uh, and it's an irony of theatrical history, incidentally, as Paul Fransen has pointed out, that long before many of Shakespeare's comedies had been played internationally um, either, audiences right across Europe first encountered Shakespeare as the hero of Alexandre Duval's much translated Shakespeare Amoureux, 1804, a deeply un-Shakespearean and anachronistic romantic comedy in which the playwright defeats some aristocratic relatives to woo and marry the actress, sick, whom he is directing in the role of Lady Anne in Richard III. Uh, and even more incidentally, and this is, you know, I'm, I'm going to try and get in as many digressions as P.A. did. Um, it's, it's a lesson in how misguided the study of theatrical history can be when pursued only via what are misleadingly treated as wholly separate national traditions. That when Lawrence Levine came upon records of this play being acted in the USA in a version by Richard Penn Smith, he assumed that it was new and described it as a uniquely American response to Shakespeare. <laughs> um, but then Levine says the same thing about staging Shakespearean tragedies on bills which also included songs and farces, uh, something which had already been the standard practice everywhere else in the world since long before the War of Independence, as any of you will know. Uh, the international saleability of Shakespeare and Rowe depends in part on its unusual reliance on plot over verbal gags especially those involving mispronunciation. A fairly straight sub Beaumarchais marche celebration of bourgeois ingenuity over feudal privilege is remarkably short on actual laughs. By contrast, the fact that the Miles Gloriosus in Love's Labour's Lost, Don Armado, as we saw earlier, not only has an inflated sense of his own valour, but displays a topically Iberian name and a pedantically non-native way of speaking, might be expected to limit that play's cross-border appeal. You would hardly have expected the Spanish audience to laugh at Don Armado, least of all if they'd been offered a touring production of this play when it was first composed within five or six years of 1588. If there's one thing mainstream European comedy loves even more than an elopement, it's the European comedy foreigner. Stage accent, mechanically predictable national behavior and all, and hence translators for the stage have spent much of their time substituting different stereotypes from one another to fit local tastes and prejudices. It's a surprise for Anglophone fans of George Fado, accustomed to John Mortimer's version of Une Puce à la for instance, usually translated as a flea in her ear, which is of course a, a stupid error, or it should be a bee in her bonnet. Um, to discover that the random, lascivious, scarcely comprehending German hotel guest who keeps blundering into the action during the central act was originally written as an English milord. Uh, and by analogy, I'm always interested to learn what French theatrical producers have done with the Merry Wives of Windsor. Mm -hmm. 
as proponents of Norman broadsides and of original pronunciation alike never tire of pointing out, Shakespeare's texts don't usually draw phonetic distinctions between the speech of different social groups. But that rule is completely flouted in The Merry Wives, a play in which Shakespeare comes so close to orthodox pan-European sitcom that it was already being adapted into mainstream comic opera by Salieri in 1799. In fact, even before that, um, there'd been a version prepared out of French in Russia, uh, to which Catherine the Great gave her name, and she claimed to have translated it herself. Uh, in Shakespeare's play, the parson Hugh Evans, or Evans, as Falstaff points out, makes fritters, i.e. Welsh rarebit, of English, while Dr. Caius boasts a French accent that wouldn't be surpassed in Rococo stylization until the coming of Inspector Clouseau. In the Italian libretto prepared for Salieri by De Franceschi, both are cut. But at one point, Miss, Mistress Ford instead pretends to be sexily German. <laughs> all this would appear to confirm Yeats' view that comedy is all about making distinctions, whether between social classes, as in Duval, or between linguistic and national subgroups. Certainly, from Shirley through Turgenev, or Maribo through Wilde, for that matter, watching comedy has been understood as a matter of working out who is in and who is out, who is socially adept so that we can admire them, and who is, as a result, going to be outmaneuvered into the position of scapegoat so that we can laugh at them. The moral point of the well-made Enlightenment social comedy, like that of the 19th century novel that succeeded, is to bring the consciousness of the protagonist into line with the consciousness of the consumer, as they too reap the lessons of the plot in an aesthetically satisfying mutual éclaircissement. Over the course of the action, the audience is supposed to exercise, or ideally to acquire, a connoisseurship of what constitutes chic and what constitutes foppishness, of what behavior is too vulgar and what is too affected, of what counts as laudable enterprise and what ranks as villainy, in short, of who is us and who is them. The semiotic expertise needed to make these judgments, even within the fictitious world of the play, is considerable and it involves a great deal of local knowledge, from which any foreign characters in the play are usually and comically excluded. The properly qualified theatre-goer, assuming this kind of play as a model, is a native. And one way in which he or she displays his or her status as such is by being right there in a box at the Theatre Royal, or the Burgtheater, or the Congelia Theatre in Copenhagen, or wherever, and knowing when to laugh. Now, as we all know, people like us don't go to plays like that anymore. You might be the very idea. Uh, but the accounts of how theatrical spectatorship works, which remain the norm in drama textbooks, are still lingeringly attached to ideas of complete audience competence, which fit Richard Brindley Sheridan's home crowd quite well, but which simply don't work in international and intercultural contexts, let alone around Shakespearean comedy. I'm thinking here of the work of Patrice Pavy, whom Miss Stell mentioned earlier. Much as I admire him, and little as I want to seem, after a wholly irrelevant digression about Lawrence Levine, to be picking on another foreigner for fun. But it seems to me that writing as if the whole point of any theatrical experience was the complete, happy, unbroken convergence of the codes deployed by the performers as a seamless group with the codes understood by the audience as a seamless group is distinctly misleading when it comes to the pleasures of watching Shakespeare's comedies, whether one does so in one's own first language or in another. Despite the hegemony which prevailed on the comic stages of London and Paris and Vienna and Madrid in the time of Duval, I do not believe that there is such a thing as a fully competent European spectator, semiotically equipped for every production uh, of a classic which may turn up on tour from anywhere else on the continent. There is still, I agree, a comedy of discrimination and belonging and recognition, and Shakespeare was a very good exponent of it. But there is also a comedy of incomprehension, and Shakespeare was a very good exponent of that too. The latter, I would suggest, is closer to the long buried or exiled Aristophanic tradition than to the Plautine, being the sort of comedy in which the gang wouldn't be funny if one knew why the birds could all talk, 
uh, or why that we needed a Ministry of City Walks, or why she kept on insisting on wearing, of all things, a brand new leather skin pillbox hat. <laughs> if we could effortlessly read all the behaviour of Puck, or Master Froth, or Snug the Joiner, never mind all the choices made by the directors and designers and actors who put them onto the stage for us, and if we could always, from moment to moment, say exactly what it all meant, we would be losing a great deal of the fun and probably a great deal of the moral point for good measure. One of the reasons uh, that I found myself getting fatigued with reviewing Anglophone Shakespeare week after week, quite apart from the fatigue, was that too often I knew from the first scene of the production onwards exactly what it was all going to be supposed to mean. I'd simply become too competent in all the codes that were likely to be activated over the course of any given English performance of Shakespeare. Mercifully, there is much less risk of that when one is watching Shakespearean comedy as adapted and translated by people from other lands. Hewitt or last, the example. Within the Anglophone world, the less assimilable aspects and specimens of Shakespearean comedy didn't disappear during the Baroque period, or not all of them, at least. They were simply displaced whether adapted into exotic and experimental genres such as oratorio, ode, and semi-opera, or fragmented into short afterpieces, or pushed to the vernacular fringes of the theatrical world to reappear as puppet plays, fairground trolls, ballad operas, burlesques. To the eyes of neoclassicism, much of Shakespeare always seemed astonishingly low and irregular anyway, and to this day, French criticism in particular delights in identifying Shakespearean comedy as an exotic refuge where folk rituals and seasonal festivals never admitted to the comedy Francaise and still lurk in disguise. In the time of modernism, everything about Shakespearean comedy that was in excess of the proscenium arch stage began to find new outlets. Whether in the work of William Pohl and other seekers after original practices, or in the outdoor experiments of the pastoral players and their imitators, and more recently, the comedies have been adapted and mined instead by exponents of site-specific and fringe theatre. Among the groups involved in this trend is one which is based at what is currently the disputed fringe of Europe itself. One question begged by any conference which talks about something in a European context is, of course, where Europe begins and ends, a question which has been sensitive ever since the term Europe was coined uh, in ancient Greek. Uh, it's often been particularly so in the Balkans, but in 2014 it is focused particularly on the matter of whether the Ukraine should be seen as a part of Europe with a history of being co-opted by Russia, or as a part of Russia with a history of being seduced by Europe. Uh, and the fact that Russia itself has always been conflicted about whether it's in Europe or not hasn't made this any simpler. The Ukrainian Shakespeare Center, based in Zaporizhia, of which I'm an honorary member, regards both Shakespeare and the Ukraine as belonging emphatically to Europe. You know, so Boris Pasternak was obviously wasting his time, I think. Um, <laughs> and several of its members have been so prominently involved in the Maidan that they have felt unable to leave the country during the present crisis. Two members of the centre, however, were present here at this year's Cry Over Shakespeare Festival in Romania, a country which they regard as naturally sympathetic, uh, and it being Romania, I'm of course using the French word uh, advisedly. Um, Romania is a former Soviet bloc country now in the EU, which has a border with Ukraine. It also has a former province, Moldova, Bessarabia, which it has long disputed with Russia, and its only stretch of coastline is on the Black Sea, with an easy reach of the conveniently Crimea-based Black Sea fleet. So at Cryova this April and May, performances involving Russian companies, such as the Vakhtangov, uh, who brought a measure for measure, and Ukrainian ones, such as the Voskresinia from Lvov, who staged in Talneri, who Prospero, were of special interest. Voskresinia performed in Tanneri Ku Prospero twice during the festival, once as its final event, when they presented it here, uh, directly in front of the Dolge County Municipal Building in the city's main square. Uh, they're rotten pictures, I'm sorry. 
And the show's first airing at the festival, however, took place the previous night at what was potentially an even more resonant location, Satanti Cultural Port, an hour to the south of Craiova on the banks of the Danube. At Satanti, there's a sort of writer's colony and local arts venue on an old estate which currently belongs to Mercer Dinescu, poet, journalist, former dissident, who now grows some of the best wine in southern Europe. During the 1989 revolution against Ceausescu, he was a close colleague of the Shakespearean actor Ion Karamitru, who is now the artistic director of the Romanian National Theatre. In this picture, you can just see a bit of the river uh, to the left. Uh, it's immediately to the left of the acting area. Uh, just beyond the river to the left, on the far back of the river, uh, is Bulgaria, um, which is within earshot, actually. A country which, because it remained under Ottoman control for longer than did Romania, is regularly vilified in classic Romanian literature as the definitive foreign other. Uh, the ridge of hills that you can see beyond the acting area, um, on the same northern bank of the Danube but a bit further upstream, is actually in Serbia. During the Cold War, these skies were patrolled by fighters built at what is now Cryova's Ford car plant flying from what is now Cryova Municipal Airport, uh, from which nowadays you can instead fly direct to Luton. Um, I don't know whether that's progress or not. <laughs> this would be an interesting site at which to see Ukrainians acting out a drama about colonialism, linguistic dominance, and the control of the next generation's breeding options at any time, uh, especially given that the Satati night at the Cryova Festival always brings together an intriguingly heterogeneous audience. Watching the Satati show, stop laughing, and watching the Satati show every two years, and subsequently eating together to the strains of a band from one of the local villages, a customarily a mixed bunch of southern Altinian theatre goers from the nearby towns of Calafat and Mandelbit, artists currently in residence Shade Inescu, and two imported busloads from the Cryo Theatre Festival consisting of actors, directors, theatre critics, and academics from all over Romania and from all over the world. This year, on May the 3rd, the audience included both Russians and Ukrainians, and the proceedings were given another dimension yet by the arrival of this man, Dr. Victor Ponta, the current Prime Minister of Romania. Um, and he's known uh, as, as uh, Dr. Um, Copy and Paste, uh, because his thesis was allegedly plagiarised. Um, though the committee that were about to declare this to be the case were fired sort of minutes before they could uh, produce their verdict. Um, Ponta turned up together with a substantial entourage of party function functionaries and security men. Ponta was paying this visit to the Cryova Festival because Shakespeare has become a matter of serious public interest in the Altenia region. Thanks to Cryova's attempts to leverage its prominence in international Shakespearean performance into a bid to become the European City of Culture for 2021. As you can see from this leaflet, the aim is to bring economic, touristic and cultural development to Cryova and hence to the whole region of Western Wallachia. The city has in fact followed exactly the strategy initiated by David Garrick at the Stratford Jubilee of 1769. Uh, and incidentally, there's a fabulous conference about Garrick coming up in Kingston in a couple of weeks, uh, during which I'm doing a plenary, uh, which I'm going to write in a taxi in 48 minutes. <laughs> um, the strategy which they've imitated from Garrick, essentially, is that of the city putting itself on the cultural map by marking a Shakespeare anniversary, consecrating some civic space to Shakespeare, and erecting a statue. Uh, on April the 23rd, 2014, Shakespeare's 450th birthday, during the inauguration of the 2014 festival, the square outside the main theatre in Cryova was officially renamed Piazza William Shakespeare. By the mayor, who also dedicated a new statue of the playwright nearby. <laughs> Quite a creepy statue. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but there you are. Um, and in the top left, top right, uh, you can see Emil Borodina, who's the sort of Garrick of, of the thing, the actor-manager who, who set up the festival and was running it for the last 20 years, 
uh, and his friend Dr. Johnson, but all rather standing wells. <laughs> uh, the little pyramid, as you can see, names the square in Romanian on one side and English on the other. Despite its funereal appearance, as if William Shakespeare were the name of a pharaoh's dead cat, this object <laughs> is intended to mark a new birth of English-speaking tourism and European Union investment in the city. Cryover, in fact, hopes to be recognised as Romania's answer to Stratford, which in some respects is perhaps setting its sights quite low. <laughs> so, as Dr. Ponter took his place in the thundery rain to watch this part of the 2014 festival, and presumably to consider, as he did so, how thoroughly his government should be backing the Cryover bid, there was a certain amount at stake. I stood somewhere behind him myself, mustering what spectatorly competence I could, as the Ukrainians began to perform in Talneri through Prospero. The first thing to say about this show is probably pretty obvious. However poetic and language heavy the Tempest may be as a source text, pageant-oriented outdoor street theatre, in which Vosper Senior have come to specialise, doesn't go in for all that much dialogue. And when it does, it's usually impossible physically to provide surtitles for the benefit of any casting foreigners. Vosprosinia, however, did have a tannoy system, which sometimes seemed to be relaying what the actor, who appeared to be the Prospero figure, was saying in Ukrainian, and sometimes seemed to be playing pre-recorded speech in a different language altogether. In fact, the only words I can claim to have understood during the whole show uh, rather to my surprise, were fi sau and nu fi, which is the Romanian for to be or not to be, uh, a phrase I learned during the 2010 festival when every single show was a version of Hamlet uh, with Romanian surtitles. Without words, what remained was iconography, choreography, pyrotechnics. A row of strange, long moustached, worn helmeted, wicker man like figures which to Northern European eyes looked like Vikings or cartoon Gauls, but which I gather were Cossacks. Yes, there they are at the back. Uh, which I gather were Cossacks, uh, traditional symbols uh, of Ukrainian ethnic identity. A lot of fanciful costumes walking about on stilts. And was this Ariel as Harpy, Ferdinand and Miranda, the Mask of Juno, something else entirely? Uh, there was a bearded Prospero placing and then removing various symbols of Renaissance knowledge and power, a globe, a telescope. At one point, he set up a Catherine wheel on a pole and set it off. Um, and there was a good deal of petrol. Uh, here used to demarcate what was presumably a magic circle, and here uh, used to incinerate Prospero's book instead of drowning it. One section of choreography, depicting a face-off between warring factions, resembled the Dance of the Knights from the Prokofiev for Romeo and Juliet. And at another point, gloomy men brought broadswords and stuck them vertically into the ground to make a graveyard. And it was then that uh, to be or not to be was intoned over the loudspeakers. There may have been fairies. <laughs> the safety rail of Shakespeare's authority was nowhere to be found. The borders of the Tempest had been abolished. Figures and images from other plays and from Ukrainian popular culture were welcomed into the show, and we could make of the whole beautiful and perplexing spectacle what we could and what we couldn't. Uh, since certainly by the time I started to take these pictures, I'd given up any pretense to understand the show in the competent, fully cognizant way fondly imagined by the semioticians. It would be perfectly possible to make an argument that Vosgrosinian's show was a political parable, or that it represented a logical aesthetic response to a play which works like one of its only lucid and opaque in set lyrics anyway, or that this show had used The Tempest solely as the source of its title, so as to get accepted onto the program of Shakespeare festivals. <laughs> But I'm not at all sure that any of these proceedings would be very much to the point. No single spectator could have been competent to read that performance. Like its source play, it was designed for none of us, and thereby for all of us. What would be to the point, I think, 
would be to record what happened after the show. When the performers of this display of some of what Shakespearean comedy includes, but which the Proscenium Arch Theatre never could, joined their audience, mercifully out of the rain at last. Wine was distributed. <laughs> Food started to appear, like Ariel's magic banquet, only thankfully not snatched away. And the local band had struck up. Now, I have a side interest in dance music, I admit, and have had done since uh, very impressionable years. Uh, and I have seen many bands. Uh, and I would rate the musicians. You know, you know, to, lap, to lapse into the kind of crass tabloid star system of evaluative criticism, I would rate the musicians who vary their schedule of Danube Village wedding receptions by playing after the Satati performance every two years among the most powerful I've ever seen, not excluding The Clash in 1977. <laughs> Three times. They call themselves Mando Syria. They have no amplification, but in a confined space, they don't need it. <laughs> they, their instruments are solely drums, brass, and a sort of melodic shouting. And while many of their lyrics are, I gather, terrible, uh, in ways which uh, Benny Hill would certainly have understood, uh, the effect is of the sort of music which Tamblay might have had played to his army just before an assault. Uh, there's apparently no polyphony in it. You know, it's, it's, the, the rhythm is absolutely extraordinary. Um, the Prime Ministerial Party were about to depart, but they stayed to dance with locals, with Russians, with Ukrainians, with actors including Valentina Zaharia, the Romanian Venus, with administrators, even with academics. <laughs> and I hate to sound folksy, and I never thought I would ever stand up in Senate House to confess to having folk danced, uh, let alone uh, with the Romanian Prime Minister. <laughs> but those French folklorists aren't wholly wrong about Shakespearean comedy. It is festive. And following a version of The Tempest with a feast and a dance seems no less appropriate than the departure of the cast of The Merry Wives of Windsor towards just such a party at the end of Act 5. Sitcom that play may be, but nobody in Windsor ever suggests that the Welsh parson and the French doctor aren't full members of the local community. You can be incomprehensibly foreign and still one of us in Windsor as in Europe. One of the spin-off genres which Shakespeare's festive comedy has produced since the mid-20th century is the European Shakespeare festival scene itself, inclusive, international, and eclectic, and long may it flourish. Whatever Yeats may have thought, the fact that communities survive and reproduce themselves, the subject of comedy, is just as universal and dike-breaking as the fact that individuals die. So long as there is hospitality, and playhouses are, of course, houses, so long as the audience know that they're included in the party anyway, then one's intercultural ignorance can be savoured and enjoyed, rather than disavowed. Epilogue. Uh, the easy, happy ending version of this talk would end there. But there is, as I say, an epilogue. There's not going to be a Bergamot dance, just an epilogue, I promise you. Uh, there was, it later transpired, at least one spectator present at Vos Rossini's show at Satante who felt perfectly competent to explain what it meant and felt perfectly competent to draw lessons about who was in and who was out, who was a deserving native and who an exploitative intruder. Under the headline, uh, Ten Paces Nearer Victor Ponta and the Ukrainians Will Open Fire, the satirical paper, Catavenci, published a sneering account of the whole event, uh, complete with this image. Uh, and of course, I'm entirely reliant on Nicola de Chimpo's uh, uh, as to what any of this means. And uh, she may be making it all up. <laughs> um, the, the subtitle under this picture reads something like, At Satati, the grand troops of the Ukrainian theatre prepare a flamethrower attack against Mambo Syria. The speech bubble refers to a recent scandal involving electoral corruption. It reads, Vanea Aliosa Seriocha, we've made it. The Socialist Democratic Party is coming to see our show. 
Pontus Party. <laughs> if we can only dress up as rustic Romanian voters, we can go back to the Ukraine bribed with more buckets, parkers, and bicycles than we can carry. Uh, so you now know that um, Pofuachi is Romanian for parkers, you know, coffer jackets, <laughs> is it's not. Uh, the article beneath this picture is relatively polite about Bosco's Sinia's production itself, but it regards Pontus' presence in the audience and at the feast as a piece of spurious man of the people propaganda, carried out by someone who was really an over-professionalized, unpatriotic member of the political class. Nor is this journalist very happy with the cosmopolitanism of the academic side of the theatre festival adding a passage about the dancing which continued after the Prime Minister's departure. I should stress that this passage is factually inaccurate to the point of being frankly libelous, uh, but I'm going to quote it anyway. Uh, it goes like this. After Ponta had gone, the kings of British theatre studies got it on with the local lasses to an insane tune by Mambo Syria. Stanley Wells, Michael Dobson, Lawrence Guntner, Paul Edmondson, John Elson, Michael Vais, not one of them under 60, <laughs> danced with the beauties from Port Satanti, ignoring their strenuous attack warnings, screaming like mad, pinching their partner's asses, exactly as they had been dreaming of doing during their long and boring London seminars. <laughs> you have to give him credit for the occasional flash of accuracy. <laughs> the elite of European criticism hopped without restraint around the jugs of Cabernet and Moscow like a pack of savages who had escaped from Prospero's control. <laughs> yes, yeah, so we were all caliber. <laughs> well, perhaps that's, that's how it would have been if we'd been in a poor time on John Stoney in a Molierian comedy, treating all movements towards reconciliation with the outsider as hypocritical, and all relations as essentially exploitative following the exclusionary conventions of Enlightenment pan-European comedy to the destruction of Europe itself. But I remember something altogether more Shakespearean, not to mention something which included Alex and Nicoletta and Mirella Frayne, uh, and the president of the British Association for Romantic Studies, and a number of other women among the alleged elite of European criticism, rather than just the guilty male cadre named in the article. Uh, and it goes on to be really insulting and offensive about, about women academics in general, in ways which I'm not going to quote. In the European elections which have taken place since that night, insular views, such as those of the disaffected journalist, have found an alarming amount of favour right across the continent. I hope that they won't lead any country to secede either from the EU or from the International Shakespearean Festival Circuit. However much or however little you understand, it's much funnier being in it. <laughs> Uh, 
Shakespeare Beyond the English, English yeah. which um, was about two performances at the Globe, the Globe Festival. And, and again, you kind of stress this competence and, you know, uh, sort of exasperation of being not competent because, for example, the programs were not provided, you know, such a simple thing. Um, so I wonder, is it, is, it, is, is, it the, is it the thing that's staying with you? Is it the issue that is kind of yeah, I mean, in your work? It's not so much that I was exasperated that one didn't get all that stuff that Estelle would have researched first <laughs> when we went to see you know, Armenians doing King John or whatever at the Globe. It's that it's that I think I think one has to relinquish the fantasy that one's going to understand it all and, and enjoy the fact that one isn't. And I don't think one should apologise for the fact that you know, one's very happy to see Armenians doing King John without speaking Armenia. Um, you know, you can only describe what you get out of it. Or, or, what, what sense it seems to make in terms of the particular mismatch between what you do randomly happen to know and what you do randomly happen not to know. Um, which, you know, and, and, and obviously there are some productions that highlight that more, more obviously than others. I mean, I, I mean, I don't know whether you want to claim that you know what that Ukrainian <laughs> prospering no. thing meant. No, in fact, Daria and Bogdan, the two Ukrainian scholars, I asked them to translate and tell me, you know, where the Prospero bit is, you know, actually, where the, where's the Tempest, you know, is that, the, is that Caliban? And they had no idea. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that was, yeah, sort of my impression. Yeah. I was just interested in, in some of the um, comments you made about um, Shakespeare's comedies and the European sort of uh, production of them, and I was just um, thinking further at the um, establishment of national theatres in parts of Europe and um, tragedies being instrumental in doing that, and I'm thinking uh, further back at quite, quite a few countries in, in Europe uh, which have appropriated Shakespeare, not via English, but via French and German, um, and mainly translating first sonnets and tragedies. So the comedies have come much later, and as you've already mentioned, why, why would you have Shakespeare comedy if you've got Moliere at the same time with Moliere? So, in, in a way, Shakespeare in, in quite a number of European countries arrives in the 19th century, and it's 19th century dramatist. So, presumably, some some of the um, um, of these sort of some some of this heritage is, is obvious in the in the construction of, of comedies, and it's only um, I would say compared to other countries in Europe, a recent. Uh, appropriation. Mm. And it's more a common than a, than a Yeah, I think that's right, with the conspicuous exception of Midsummer Night's Dream in Germany, mm -hmm. which, you know, with Thanks to Mendelssohn, which, which sort of it's in. And the fact, and the 19th century nationalism's enthusiasm for fairies. You know, the, if you're going to do the playwright as the voice of the native soil, then you need Midsummer Night's Dream because, you know, the fairies speak for the land. You know, they're, they're, it's all about Shakespeare's rooted, mm -hmm. rustic, you know, might as well have been Robert Burns, you know, sort, sort of, uh, sort of local um, person who's in touch with national ethnic folk traditions. You know, it's the, it's, it's the sort of folk national side of Shakespeare that the, com that the comedies get used for in the 19th century when they appear at all. But absolutely, yeah, I mean, the, the Shakespeare first reaches much of Europe uh, dressed up as Walter Scott, uh, and, and um, you know, it's quite fetching. You know, you get some good tunes from time to time. Um, yeah, it's true. Yeah, yeah. So thanks. That was really fun. On top of being really interesting, <laughs> and I was particularly I liked the Bob Dylan line. Um, but <laughs> but I, one of the things that's really interesting to me is to think about what we've been talking about um, as against a lot of the talk about reviewing. Because one of the things that I was thinking about in terms of, of Aaron's work in Fifth Time and online is that one of the problems is that online is in, in my opinion, has a real affection for categories. And so, and, and we've had an affection for categories this, e this evening, right? It's been very interesting. We, you know, we academics write like, the academics write like, the critics write like, right? And so it's like, our, so, you know, what, jer what jersey are you wearing? You're wearing your academic jersey, your practical jersey, blah, blah, blah. All of which, for me, means that the conversations end. Yeah. So one of the things I find really interesting about you talking about incompetence is that and I say this with great affection, you've grown more incompetent. And I think the great thing about that is that because, because I think actually the practice of spectating, whatever we want to call it, the sense of, of not only being there, but writing about it, returning, so you return to these festivals, the returning becomes not just, uh, I've been here before I know what to do, 
but also of, of release of the need to be the expert, right? And I think that brings us back in some sense to, to you talking about the Maori, um, because one of the things that is still problematic and that um, critic makes it very clear in his misogyny is that this is a remarkably white male world and that one of the things that becomes interesting about the incompetence is that watching, for example, The Winter's Tale at the Globe to Globe meant that there was a narrative shift in that production that was one of the most brilliant dramatic moves I've seen. And, and again, the incompetence or the not needing to be competent and therefore in a conversation with people who, who are going and looking or listening or talking means that there's a possibility that, that also things open out beyond we can put, you're the greatest Hamlet of your generation because you're the next really popular white boy, right? So, so in these contexts, I think these things actually, again, circulate. It, 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 it cheers me to think that there's a way also in which what becomes really vital and moral in some sense about theater is the possibility that it is, it is also a place where flaws are part of what we bring to it. Yeah. 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 Thank God I've got lots of them. Yes, darling. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a great comfort. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 yeah, I mean, and, 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 as you say, I mean, the thing I find depressing about going to see the RSC, much as I, much as I'm supposed to apologise for the mistake of slagging them off these days, um, is is that um, I, you know, I arrive at an RSC production and within 30 seconds I think, oh my God, I'm competent to deal with this. <laughs> I know exactly what's going to happen. You know, I, need to, I know, I can see which, you know, which sound system we're in and. What you, you know, you can pre not a, not just predict what they're going to do, but but predict what you're going to feel about it. You, you, you know, it, I, I go, I leave at the interval much more often than I ever used to. It's partly just being old and tired, of course, but but uh, it's partly just not expecting to be surprised by not expecting to be um, meeting something spe surprising and other, which you know if. Which even in the, the globalized post burning world, you know, I might be surprised uh, and find a Maori other. Um, you know, and, and obviously, the risk is that it slips over into being, well, these people are foreign, so I can just enjoy them as exotic spectacle um, instead of having to understand a word they're saying or, or what it might look like to them. Um, but um, yeah, I still I think I'd rather be watching Tintin, uh, watching as Tintin, than, than watching as. You know, oh God, I could have written a program out of this one. I did write the program. One gets into. I thought that was just to follow on from that. I thought what was so interesting in so many ways about the Globe to Globe Festival, in particular, was the way that it shifted those kind of competencies. So you, so you have really, and of course, with every audience at a theatre event, you have different degrees of competency, whatever one we, might mean by that. You know, some people probably don't know how that ends. Mm -hmm. uh, some mm -hmm. people know it intimately and minutely. But I, I thought what was fascinating about seeing those productions particularly is that you, yeah, some, there's a kind of series of Venn diagrams going on around, you know, what's the thing that's closest to you in the space? Is it the language? Is it your half of language? Is mm -hmm. it the play? And certainly, I mean, it, it's become a kind of truism, I think, of, of kind of talking about global Shakespeare that, you know, Shakespeare without his language, and that's sort of rather dreadful <laughs> phrase, uh, you know, whatever that means, whichever language you mean by that, that that's a kind of liberation theatre makers, I often think it's a liberation for audience mm -hmm. as well, I think it's exactly what yeah. we're talking about, yeah. Michael, that there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a way in which you think actually, yeah, whether it is to do with otherness or, or difference or strangeness or simply actually just being a square one again, <laughs> which <coughs> is not the thing that happens very often in, in the sort of Shakespeare kind of aspect. Mm -hmm. um, can I take one last question <coughs> because we do need to wrap up? Yes. Yeah, I just want to know, just on that point, how much that is to do with you know, interpretation of how much to do with what I found um, very difficult to, to overcome was was my resistance to certain acting styles. Mm -hmm. So that there is just a way of delivering lines that is, you know, I mean, in this country and in any country, um, that is extremely irritating because it, it is. It's just, and that's what's predictable. So whatever they were doing, they would yeah. still be doing it yeah. just like that. Just like my intonation right yeah. now yeah. is making fun of it in that particular way. Yeah. Um, and that's something that if you go in day, day in day out, you just hear and you don't go any further. Yeah. 
All right, thank you very much. I'm going to ask our fellow host to, to come up in a second. But first of all, we please thank Michael.